Turn the lights back on. Wow. Retro Electro Tech. When real audio ruled the world. world. Greetings once again all of you vintage audio tomcats and pretty kitties. This is Retro Ernest of Retro Electrotech, and I can see you're all poised and positioned at the uh, classic receiver banquet table with napkins and utensils in hand. So, the main course before us is a late 1970s Kenwood KR9600 from that golden age of audio, weighing in at 53 pounds of... <laughs> so, lugging this onto the bench is not for the faint of heart and may require an underwear change for some. All that aside, um, this big old bruiser here brings to us 160 forehead slapping watts into 8 ohms to rattle your old bones. So adult diapers and hearing aid insurance is recommended. Otherwise, um, we have THD specs, that is total harmonic distortion of 0.08% and a frequency response of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So in this video, a uh, preliminary evaluation is what we'll get started with, and in doing so, I'm going to ask the patient to disrobe, so turn around, close your eyes, so uh, that I can begin a cursory inspection before I perform a safe power-up. Uh, obviously, uh, or perhaps not so obvious to some of you uh, newer cats on the block, is a need for um, us to check for those red flag issues that are often uh, visible such as bulging uh, and or you know physically leaking electrolytic capacitors uh, discolored or in other words components that look overheated or even burned you know cracked fractured blown open uh, you know we're looking for damage to wiring including the uh, power cord of course and uh, damage to circuit boards um, such things that look like they failed catastrophically in other words you know arky sparky scary stuff because um, if we do notice such things, it would be wise not to power up until we clean it up. And here we are, my brothers from other mothers and sisters from other misters. Everything is looking pretty good uh, from what I can see thus far. We have our quintessential dust and fuzz layer, but even that isn't um, horrible. So um, I'll get that cleaned up a bit to start with in just a moment. And I've been through this with the... Uh, magnifier not on camera of course because that's kind of tedious i didn't want to burn up too much time with that but um as far as the you know visual integrity of components as well as the wiring and boards um everything is looking good now this is a uh, dual power supply setup with our four main 80 volt 10,000 mic filter or reservoir caps all of which are physically looking good but you know that only tells so much right so um, if I do end up moving forward with this, at the very least, um, these caps are going to be pulled, ESR and leakage tested, or just uh, replaced. We'll see. You know, it depends on budget. Also, let's take a look at these, um, at these amp sections here. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. And here we are with the camera balancing precariously on a little tripod. And here we have our power amp module and amp board. Um, same thing on both channels obviously. Now this circuitry is critical in terms of making sure that all the components on these boards are within tolerance. We want to replace any electrolytics. Of course we don't want a catastrophic failure occurring on this board and jeopardizing this uh, uh, power amp module. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. We also want to ensure we have good thermal coupling between this module and the uh, heat sink. Um, the heat sink compound will uh, degrade over time sometimes it kind of dries out it gets flaky you know i can't speak for every single formulation of heat sink compound in terms of you know it's a degradation rate and all that stuff but um if you guys you know work on this stuff you know what i'm talking about so in other words um it's a good idea to clean the old uh, heat sink compound from between uh, the surfaces and of course reapply it and you know, the objective once again is to have, you know, reliable components on the board and, you know, to optimize that heat transfer and dissipation that's taking place between the module and the heat sink. And, um, you know, we want to keep this, um, this module here, well, both modules, uh, healthy and happy, assuming that they're in good shape to begin with because, of course, I haven't powered it up, so I don't know what the status is. 
So anyways, and by, you know, keeping it uh, healthy and happy and keeping everything, you know, uh, running good on the board and, uh, you know, thermal transfer and dissipation uh, where it needs to be, we're minimizing the potential of something, you know, failing badly and, and killing uh, the module. As far as sourcing, these modules are concerned, if something uh, does go wrong or something is wrong, you know, it's just kind of hit and miss. You know, these obviously haven't been made in a long time. You don't know what you're going to get on the used market as far as a pool is concerned. And when I say pool, I'm talking about, um, you know, pulled from a, a donor unit, whatever the case, unless you can find something new old stock. Uh, there are Chinese knockoffs out there that I wouldn't use, but, um, and I don't know if there's Chinese knockoffs to uh, replace uh, this particular module here. I know in dealing with other uh, receivers and amps and all that, they are out there, but I wouldn't use them anyways. Oh, and by the way, for those of you that may not know what uh, thermal compound is, and I have all kinds of different brands, but it's just, um, let me let me angle this to get the glare. Uh, it's just a paste, okay? And uh, again, I use different stuff. This is, uh, this is a good compound here, a, a high heat uh, compound uh, made by Dow Corning. And, but there's all kinds of stuff you can use out there. So anyways, um, that's about it. I want to go ahead and move on and just kind of get to that point of uh, you know getting closer to, to a safe uh, power up and I'll explain that process once I get there. And also too, um, you know I've examined you know both boards, both channels, and visually everything is looking okay. I haven't you know examined the bottom of the board yet, but as far as uh, any of these components, you know, looking stressed, overheated, or otherwise damaged, or you know, bulging caps, leaking caps, everything is looking pretty good. So I'm pretty confident that we're getting close to that uh, safe power up. So um, let's go ahead and move on. Okay, so now I'm getting ready to muscle this thing once again and uh, examine the underbelly of this unit. But before doing so, I want to point out my little. Uh, Happy hippie hieroglyphic for the future generation promoting peace, love, and music, courtesy of their vintage audio forefather, Retro Ernest. Here we are at the underbelly. I'm not going to pan out to show an overview, so I'll just kind of pan around, give you a lay of the land. Obviously, we have the bottom of our transformer here, we have the uh, bottom of the um, amp boards here and here. Uh, we have a preamp board, I think a mic preamp here. We have some switches and, uh, you know, our controls, you know, tone board. We have uh, power board A on the top side. We have power board B. We have a relay board here. And I've been um, spending some time checking everything under magnification as far as the component integrity, the integrity of wiring, doing the best I can just to kind of go through and do a cursory here. Uh, what I am going to do, and you know, off camera, is just um, check uh, fuses. We have our 10 amp, 250 volt rated fuse here, and um, that's always a must. And, you know, and I think that goes without saying that you want to. And there's some fuses around the top side too. You want to check your fuses because if there is a uh, an open fuse, then um, you need to ask why that is. So you know, that's an obvious indicator of a of a, an issue. So. I'm going to do that and then um, start prepping for a safe power up and I will uh, come on back to um, you know this uh, current limiter here once I have everything uh, plugged in ready to go and explain the process what it is that I'm doing and we will go from there. So I'm performing a safe power up on this uh, current limiter or dim bulb tester. There are some keywords I just spoke that sum up the purpose of what I'm doing here and that is safely powering up this receiver by limiting the flow of current to it while I monitor the illumination or brightness of the uh, bulb that I have pulled in uh, to the current limiter, um, which in turn should initially glow brightly for a brief moment during that initial um, inrush or current draw from the big filter caps charging up. Um, and after the, the caps level off, the bulb should dim down, hence dim bulb tester, and depending on the wattage of the bulb um, versus the size of the load or current draw from the device under test, um, this is what determines how bright the bulb is going to remain glowing after that initial surge or uh, inrush that I was talking about. Excuse me. So uh, essentially, the resistance of a particular bulb filament will limit the current once again to the device under test. So how do I read the um, current limiter so as to benefit from the information it gives me? 
Well, again, we know what it does. It restricts or governs current flow. So with the proper bulb wattage matched to the normal current draw of the device under test when it's just idling there, um, you know, you'll be able to monitor when a piece of gear starts trying to uh, fail badly, okay? And in that situation, the uh, dimly glowing bulb is going to light up and indicate uh, current draw in excess of what it should be at idle, while at the same time, the current or energy needed for the failure to occur is denied, you know, to the device under test. So that being the case, you can read the uh, receiver or amp, whatever, you know, you can read its behavior and keep it under control. And you have the option of increasing and decreasing the uh, current flow incrementally by bringing in or removing the various bulb wattages one at a time or in combination. Now you saw the uh, three switches on the side of the uh, current limiter. Well, that's what those are for. And ultimately, you want to bring the device under test into that functional zone at some point. Um, where, for example, the relays pull in and the circuitry um, throughout the device under test sort of springs back to life because you don't have any real heavy current uh, restrictions imposed on that, you know, DUT device under test. So um, I want to get into that a little bit. And once we have everything dialed in, in other words, when the appropriate bulb size or sizes are switched in, You'll be able to read from there the more subtle or not so subtle changes in bulb uh, brightness starting from an idle dim bulb state or um, shall I say with this device under test uh, detached from any speakers or a dummy load whatever the case the tone control set flat the volume down and just in a uh, ready state you know ready for testing. If there is no change in current demand uh, brought on by a fault situation, we should have a dim glow of the bulb present as the device under test remains in that idle and uh, normal state of current draw that we are once again dialed into with the current limiter. And if that big failure tries to happen, the um, excess current draw needed for that event to take place is going to be clamped off by the bulb filament or filaments, depending on how many bulbs you have pulled in or switched in. And it's going to be those uh, filaments that take the brunt of the fault current, which in turn is dissipated as heat energy as those filaments uh, glow brightly. So as I close out this segment that covered a little more info uh, surrounding the use and workings of the current limiter, I'm going to zoom in on it and start switching in the bulbs one at a time, starting with the uh, lowest a 40 watt bulb, excuse me, <clears throat> and I'll work up from there just to demonstrate the heavier current limiting as we start off and then, you know, the decrease in current limiting as I switch in or bring in the bigger bulbs to the point where you'll hear the protect relay pull in once the circuit receives enough current to operate and, uh, you know, that again is the zone that I let the uh, device under test idle in for a time and during that period, I monitor things closely. I allow some time for caps to reform somewhat. And once everything simmers for a time, and I uh, feel that I can safely move into more function testing, as well as uh, the carrying out of other tests, then um, we'll be moving into that phase as well. And again, I'll get a signal into the device under test and get the scope hooked up and go from there. So let's move forward. Okay, so I'm going to get started with switching in or bringing in the 40 watt bulb. Because of the amount of current limiting that it's going to impose on the device under test, um, you're going to see the bulb come in very bright. It might level off just a little bit, but it's still going to hang there at a pretty bright um, level, okay? It's going to be glowing pretty bright because of the amount of uh, current that is being dissipated through the filament of the bulb in, you know, the form of heat energy. So that, that filament is going to be glowing pretty bright because it has to take the brunt of that current. So um, let me go ahead and bring the bulb in and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So there's our 40 watt uh, bulb. So it looks like it leveled off just a little bit, but it's still glowing uh, pretty bright. It's hanging there pretty bright. And again, it's, you know, dissipating that excess current as a heat energy through the filament. 
So that's what it has to do to uh, keep that kind of a clamp on the uh, device under test as far as uh, current limiting is concerned. So um, if I pan down as well, you'll notice a very slight glow of the uh, dial face uh, lamps. So it's still pretty starved of current. And that's okay because if we're bringing up a, a device that is uh, unknown, we don't know its history, you know, we want to do so, in, you know, in a manner that is, of course, once again, safe and we're not going to lose control of the device under test and there's not going to be uh, big scary things happening. So even though there's that bright glow that's taking place because of the uh, size uh, bulb that I have pulled in versus the um, device under test and where it's idling, well, you know, as I already mentioned, there's a bit of a um, current dissipation taking place right now, but I'm still monitoring the stability of the bulb, okay? You know, it's not flickering, there's it's not trying to run away and uh, increase in intensity, indicating that, you know, something is trying to fail and draw heavier current. So that's not happening. Um, so you just want to look for that as you're, you know, increasing the uh, size of the bulb, as you're um, switching in the other bulbs and allowing more current into the uh, device under test. You want to monitor this stuff as you go. So let me go ahead and pull out the uh, 40 watt uh, bulb and bring in the uh, the 60. Okay. So no relay pulled in. So the device under test is still being starved of current to that uh, point where the circuit is not springing back to life. And you may not be able to tell, but there's less of a glow taking place um, when compared with the uh, 40 watt uh, bulb before it. So the 60 watt bulb is not glowing as bright, which is to be expected. It's allowing a little bit more uh, current into the device under test. And um, there you go. So. Everything's still looking good. I don't see anything, you know, flickering or fluctuating or whatever. Um, the device under test isn't trying to run away and fail and all that stuff, draw heavy current. So uh, let me go ahead and switch that 60 watt bulb out of there and bring in the 100 watt bulb. And there you go. Our uh, protect relay pulled in and let me also pan down to the dial lamps you can see those are glowing brightly now okay so what I'm gonna do is this is where I want the device under test to idle okay you know first I'm gonna bring it up you know a bit slower and I've mentioned before that you can, of course, combine the, your uh, variac with a current limiter. You know, put your current limiter in line with the variac and have more control uh, adjustability over, you know, bringing up a device under test. But I very rarely do that. I do that once in a while. You know, there's a time and a place for everything. But uh, the current limiter, in most cases, gives me what I need to bring up a device under test in a manner that uh, it's going to be done so safely. I'm really going to be limiting that current and uh, protecting that uh, device under test just in case it wants to, uh, you know, run away and try to fail. Okay, so this um, receiver has been simmering on the uh, current limiter for a while, about two hours now, not a single hiccup. Everything has remained stable. So what I want to do now is see um, how well this uh, receiver is outputting and let me go ahead and um, zoom into the scope here so I have a uh, one kilohertz tone um, piped into the uh, auxiliary in at um, 300 millivolts so let me bring up the volume
And you can see that there's some asymmetry between the two channels, just a little, not a big deal. They're not, uh, you know, the waveforms aren't laying on top of each other, but again, not a big deal. That may be on account of the uh, balance control itself. I'm gonna have to look into that. I know that there's some, uh, some noise in that control. If I, you see if I start messing around with it a bit, you can see the, um, you can see the noise there, see that? Things are a bit intermittent and yeah. So there you have it. But again, uh, once I get in and start working on the controls a bit and flushing them out thoroughly and relubricating everything, I'll take, a, I'll take a better look at that control. But anyways, let me continue bringing up the volume and see what we are outputting. Let me get it just uh, pre-clipping there. So right about, okay, right about there. Okay, let me see there. So 182.3 watts out of a 160 watt receiver. Can't complain about that. So what we have here is a uh, sweep taking place and um, things are looking okay. Again, there's that asymmetry there between the two channels, but other than that, um, there's not too much uh, deviation in amplitude. You know, ideally we want to see the least amount of uh, deviation taking place with the uh, amplitude uh, throughout the uh, range of the sweep, which is, again, uh, 20 hertz to 20K. And keep in mind, um, everything looks original within this receiver, so I don't think it, there's any work that's been done. So, again, everything is looking good. So what I'm gonna do now is, um, let me back out of here first. So, um, mission accomplished, safe power up. Again, let it uh, simmer for a bit. Not one single uh, hiccup. Everything's looking good. You know, 182.3 or whatever it was, as far as uh, the output goes, looking good there. The frequency response didn't look too bad either. Um, little deviation in amplitude, but all things considered, it's not looking too bad. So I'm happy with that. I'm going to, um, send this link to the uh, customer so that he can uh, see that this thing is functioning and um, him and I will talk about the direction that um, you know we'll, we'll take this thing depending on budget so at the very least as I always say um, we should definitely get the uh, get the power supply sections in here and the uh, and the amp boards and whatnot all uh, redone and uh, you know bolstered up, freshened up, and then just kind of see what there is to see after that. Of course, like I said, I'm going to go through and clean out the controls thoroughly and you know remove from the equation any issues with uh, the controls, issues that you know stem from you know dirty controls and intermittent controls, that sort of thing. So we'll get that wrapped up. Otherwise, um, I'm going to end it here. As I always say, peace, love, music, and the vintage audio that brings it to your ears. Till next time, take care. This is a poor man's shoe production.